Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. I've been uh, spending a lot of time deleting comments and banning people off my channel. You know, it's amazing the number of people that will deny that Jesus was God in the flesh, Emmanuel. They will deny the inspiration of the New Testament in Greek. And they even, you know, they deny that Christ is a member of the Godhead, that God created the heavens and the earth. And he came in human form to redeem us from sin. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, one guy just booted off. He He's telling me that Jesus was just another prophet and I should be listening to Moses and keep Moses' laws. Really? Jesus created Adam and Eve who begat, when you go down the line far enough, Moses. And they want me to think that Moses is even greater prophet than Jesus. They're idiots. They're idiots. Well, this is going to be the uh, probably the last part of the fig series. And as I've done, if you haven't listened to parts one, two, and three, I think this is part four. But the fig tree was representative of the tribe of Judah, whereas the olive vine was representative of Israel of which was 12 tribes, of which Judah was only one of the 12 tribes. Judah was the tribe of the kings. Levi was the tribe of the priesthood. And then you had 10 other tribes. So, let's take a look at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, all things were made by him. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. All right, so this is, when you go down, we're going to go down to, uh, let's see, what verse? So, you know, John tells everybody, this is the Lamb of God, who was, you know. So John told everybody who Christ was. All right, let's go down. Verse 36. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, John, John the Baptist, right? He saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. So John had two disciples, but when they heard, you know, John saying, Behold the Lamb of God, they quit following John and they went after following, well, they went to follow after Christ. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, in parentheses, which is to say being interpreted, Master, okay, so when the Hebrew roots people uh, and the Messianic Jews always want you to call their rabbis rabbis, basically they're you're calling the rabbi master. Well, there's only one rabbi, one master, and that's Christ. Matter of fact, uh, when Jesus said to call no man father, he also said not to call any man rabbi. Didn't he? 
Let's take a look. All right, let me prove a point. Matthew chapter 23. Verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Oh, yeah. The Pharisees, a denomination of the Jews. They want to sit in the seat of Moses. Like, their opinion is even more important than Moses. Jesus said, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. In other words, they talk the talk, but they do not walk the walk. Oh yeah, they'll say, but they won't do. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. Oh yeah, everything that they do, they do it to draw attention to themselves. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. I'm sorry, and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Now, Jesus is speaking to his disciples here, right? And the multitudes. He says in verse 8, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, that's him. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth. What do the Catholics call their priests? And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. And then here's the hypocrite chapter. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Now, Pharisees a Jew. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer or allow, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And then in the next verse, he calls them hypocrites. Then in the next verse, he calls them hypocrites. Uh, I can't even, they, he says hypocrites so many times. Verse 23, he calls them hypocrites. Verse 25 calls them hypocrites again. Verse 27 calls them hypocrites again. Verse 29, hypocrites again. And then in verse 33, he says, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets. Yeah. Christ, God in the flesh, sent unto the Pharisees prophets. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barchias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar.
Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. Not Rome, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. And stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house, Jerusalem, behold, your house is left unto you desolate, empty, nothingness. Verse 39, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Oh yeah. Their house is going to be left unto them desolate. Let's go back to John chapter 1, verse 38, 37. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, now, if the, old, if the old New Testament was originally written in Hebrew and then translated into the Greek, why did they put this? Why did they take rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master, why would they put that note in there? I mean, if it was Hebrew, wouldn't they know what rabbi means? No, it was written in Greek. That's why they interpreted. Rabbi is a... Um, I think it's a Hebrew name or Aramaic or, you know. So they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? In other words, where, where are you staying? He, Jesus, he saith unto them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is, being interpreted, the Christ. Messiah, that's uh, the Greek rendering of the word, the Hebrew word, Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas which is by interpretation, a stone. A stone. Not the stone. A stone. Jesus is the rock. Now, I did an entire study on that. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Isn't that funny? Jesus called him an Israelite. What do the uh, what do the Jews call themselves when they're over in the Middle East? They call themselves Israelis. They don't call themselves Israelites, do they? No, they call themselves Israelis. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. So Nathanael was under the shadow of the fig tree. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto you, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You see, Christ was not only the Son of God, he was also the Son of Man. He was Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh. And it's amazing, all the Hebrew roots people that will deny this. Uh, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The book of Timothy was written by Paul. Another reason why the Hebrew roots deceivers hate Paul. And we read, and without controversy, you know, a lot of people say this verse is controversial. Paul says, no, it's not. Without any controversy whatsoever, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who's he talking about? Christ. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. There's nothing controversial about Christ being God in the flesh, unless you listen to these Hebrew roots deceivers. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans. Remember, Jesus was from Galilee, right? There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, if Pilate had taken... Uh, these people's blood and, and mingled it or mixed it with their sacrifices for the temple, they were defiled. Those, those sacrifices were defiled. Okay, that would be, uh, you're making an offering to God, but it's, you know, defiled. I mean, but, you know, Pilate was no angel, evidently. But then again, we don't know what these people did, so, you know, I don't know. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. You know, right there, Jesus tells you, that if we don't repent, we're going to perish just like these Galileans did. And uh, I've mentioned it before, and I'll mention it again. There are people that will try to confuse you on the word repent or repentance, where God said he repented, and Jesus telling people to repent. And they'll tell you it means the same thing. No. God repents of judgment that he's going to bring upon people. We need to repent of our wickedness. There's a big difference. And there are famous internet preachers out there that will tell you, oh, you don't need to repent, just believe. You need to repent of your unbelief. Well, Jesus was talking to people that believed him, and he told them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners, not unbelievers. He didn't say, oh, suppose ye that those Galileans were unbelievers above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you nay, but except they repent of their unbelief. No, that's not what Jesus said. He said, suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners. 
above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse 4, or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse 6, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Ooh. Who's a certain man? God the Father. Who's the vineyard? Israel. We did this in verse uh, in the first and second studies, right? A certain man had a fig tree implanted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. God planted Judah in his vineyard of Israel, and he came and he sought fruit, good works. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. What's the deal with these three years? Why three years? How long was Christ's ministry? A lot of people say it was three years, three and a half, whatever. Is it right? Is it wrong? I don't know exactly. I, I don't know in the Bible where it says, you know, Jesus preached for three years. I, I don't know. I'm just going by what other people say. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, the symbol of Judah, and find none. Cut it down. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? In other words, this thing, this fig tree is useless. Chop it down. Why even have this stupid fig tree take up space in the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. Dung is uh, animal waste, fertilizer. Uh, you know, so he's going he's gonna to take, you know, cow droppings or whatever. He's going to dig around it, fertilize it with dung. And he answering and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Ooh. So how did the Lord fertilize the, the fig tree? He preached and preached and preached. And when it didn't bear fruit, Judah, what happened? He cut it down. Boom. All right, let's go to Matthew 21. You ever wonder why Jesus cursed the fig tree? Well, here it is. I covered this a little bit in the uh, previous study, but we're going to take a detailed look at it this time. Matthew 21, verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her, Loose them and bring them unto me. All right, he's getting ready to do his uh, entry in Jerusalem, right? Verse 3. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. 
The disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the tree and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. I bet you he didn't win any friends when he did that, huh? And overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests, not the Catholic priests, these were Jewish priests, and when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased. They were mad. Oh, yeah. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? Don't you hear what these children are saying, Jesus? They're praising you as if you're the God. We can't have that. And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. Now we get to the meat. And when he, Jesus, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, the symbol of Judah, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. There's no fruit. He came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. The fig tree, the symbol of Judah, the Jews. He came to it, he found nothing on the, no fruit to eat, nothing good, only leaves, and said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. So when somebody tells you we need to go back to our Hebrew roots. There's no fruit on the tree of Judaism. Well, there is. It's bad fruit. It's poison, actually, people. Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which, if ye tell me, I will and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. 
Really? He heals the sick, he, he makes the blind to see, and you're asking by whose authority does this? Really? Uh, the Jews would have you believe that by the power of the devil. So Jesus asks him, verse 25, the baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reason with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? Or if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 21. You can read a parallel account of this in Matthew 24. And I believe Mark, Mark 13, I believe it is. But we're going to read Luke chapter 21. We're going to probably read the whole thing here. Here's some really good advice from Christ himself. Luke 21 verse 1, And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. What treasury? The temple. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. Two mites is like a couple of pennies to us. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offering of God, but she of her penury hath kissed cast in all the living that she had. And as some spake at the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, All, uh, oh, I'm sorry, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So when the Jews try to tell you the wailing wall is part of the temple, you got a choice to make. Jesus said there wouldn't be one stone left upon another. Or you can think Jesus told the truth, or you could say the Jews told the truth, and the Wailing Wall is part of the temple. Personally, I believe Jesus. Verse 7. And they asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be, and what sign will there be when these things come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, so they're asking him, well, what's going to be the sign of your coming and, you know, the end time stuff? And he said, take heed, pay attention, listen. Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars... And commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines and pestilences. You know what? When you got famines, when people don't have food, Pestilences, disease always follows because your body has no, uh, when you're starving, you have no ability to fight disease. Then it's only a question of what kills you first, the lack of food or the disease. And you know what? When Jesus warns you that there's, not, there's going to be problems with a lack of food, if you've got any brains in your head, you ought to put away something for a rainy day. But of course, if you're a, a, a goer to a Baptist church, they'll say, oh, don't, this is for the Jews. Don't listen to this. We're going to be out of here, the pre-trib rapture. We don't, none of this applies to us. This is for the Jews. Jesus is warning the Jews. That's what they tell you. And great earthquakes shall be in divers places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Now, I'm, uh, let's see. 
But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. Wait a minute. Uh, they're going to lay their hands on us, persecute us? I mean, if, if you listen to the Baptists, listen to the, their line of reasoning. Uh, the Jews are going to lay their hands on you Jews and persecute you and deliver you up to the synagogues. So Jews are going to deliver the Jews up to the synagogues. Huh? Does that make sense? No. The Jews are going to lay hands on you, persecute you, and deliver you up to the synagogues. Not unbelieving Jews, but believers that are called Christians. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. Who hangs out in the synagogues? And into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Yeah, we're going to be, some of us will be forced or made to testify for Jesus. Here's some good advice. Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. Don't think about what you're going to say. Jesus says, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. So if you go to prison and they get ready to kill you for your testimony of Christ, don't think about what you're going to say. Christ is going to give you a mouth and wisdom of what to say when the time comes. And that will be by the Holy Spirit. And that will be your proof that God is with you. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be betrayed by Zionist, dispensational, pre-trib rapture, Baptist churchgoers. Because let me tell you something, people. I have no problem with people teaching the pre-trib rapture. As long as they tell people that's their theory. That that's what they believe. And that there are others that believe, well, the middle of the tribulation, and then others that teach the, the rapture or gathering together of the church happens at the end of the tribulation. You know, as long as they teach, that's their belief. But when they say that the pre-trib rapture is 100% true and everybody else is a false prophet, that makes them, if they're wrong, about the pre-trib rapture. That makes every single preacher that teaches that as 100% fact, that makes them a false prophet if they're wrong. Think about it. You want to hear some harsh words? Turn to Jeremiah chapter 14. God was mad, angry, and he's going to bring judgment upon a wicked and evil people. And I'm telling you, America and Europe, it's coming. Just the same as it was back in the old days, it's coming today. I mean, when you got people arguing over whether gays, sodomites, should be able to get married and adopt children, little boys, I mean, it's just, you know, and then they're worried about well, you know, the army uh, should be able to pay for, you know, if a man decides he wants to be a woman, the army hospital should pay for that, you know. I mean, what kind of sickening garbage is this? I mean, it's, it's, it's coming, people. It's coming. And you don't, the churches are 501c3, that's an IRS regulation on how to be tax exempt, they're, they're, they're corporations. Churches are businesses. And they'll never go against public policy because if they do, they'll lose their tax-exempt status. I mean, let's face it. You could have an openly sodomite 
an open sodomite running for public office, and a Christian, and a church can't even say, I, the pastor can't even say, I think we ought to support the Christian. They can't say that. Well, they won't say that, because the sodomites will file complaints, and uh, the church will lose its tax-exempt status. Churches are businesses. That's why they teach the pre-trib rapture, not because it's truth. They treat, teach it because they want to keep those tithes coming in. And it's amazing how all the laws of God were nailed to the cross with Jesus, except for the tithe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, got to keep that tithe coming in. Pastor's got to keep that new Cadillac. I remember when I was in middle school, we, uh, we were, for like six months, were going out and selling whatever, candy or whatever, collecting donations for the, the uh, evangelists that went to Africa. We never met him, never talked to him, just, you know, the church was telling us this, and then uh, collected a, supposedly a, a, a enough money, you know, for months. And then next thing I know, the, ca uh, the pastor shows up and bought a brand new Cadillac. I think it was the second, if memory serves me correctly, it was the second most expensive Cadillac made. Of course, the first and second most expensive Cadillacs, depending upon what options you got, I mean, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about being able to buy three Volkswagens for what this car cost, or two Chevrolets for what this car cost. You know, and nice, bright, shiny Cadillac. You know, that's when I kind of saw a lot of junk in the church and made me want to, you know, fall away. Of course, I wanted to live in sin anyways. You know, rebellious teenager, coming of age, you know, uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, basically, well, not much sex, but uh, drugs and rock and roll, yay, that was my theme and motto back in the teen days, but you know, let's take a look at what the Lord says about things. Jeremiah 14, 11. Then saith the Lord unto me. The Lord's talking to Jeremiah. He says, pray not for this people, for their good. Don't pray for them, Jeremiah. Don't you dare pray for these people. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword, which is war, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword. You're not going to see the great tribulation. You're not going to have to suffer for your faith in Christ. God's going to rapture you out of here in the pre-trib rapture. Then said I, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine. But I will give you assured peace in this place. Then said the Lord unto me, The prophets the preachers, the pastors, I'm sorry, the prophets prophesy lies, lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their own heart. Therefore, Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not, yet they say, Sword and famine shall not be in this land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. All the preachers that preach the pre-trib rapture is fact. By sword and famine, they're going to be consumed. Verse 16, And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword, and they shall have none to bury them, 
them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour out their wickedness upon them. Wow. You think the Lord changes? No. No. Let's go back to Luke 21. And ye shall be betrayed, both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, and some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. What name? Jesus. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience, patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, when you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, right? Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Now this was uh, a warning for 70 A.D. In 70 A.D., uh, the Roman, the Roman, two at least two Roman legions surrounded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, burnt it to the ground. Not one stone was left upon another. They wiped the plate clean and then turned it upside down. So, was this completely fulfilled? Well, you know what? Right now, the Jews are planning on rebuilding their temple. Will it come to pass? I don't know for a certainty, but I believe it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen, but that's just my opinion. And I could be wrong. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and not let them that are in the countries enter their in two. Do you know that when, according to the historians, the Roman legions surrounded Jerusalem and then they withdrew, which when all the Christians that listened to Jesus here saw the armies withdraw, they fled and they went to the mountains and they were spared. Well, then the Roman legions came back and then they slaughtered everybody in Jerusalem because the Jews did a rebellion against uh, the Romans. Remember when, they, when the Jews were crying unto Pilate, crucify him, crucify him? And Jesus said, uh, Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And the Jews said, we have no king but Caesar. Oh, yeah. Verse 22, For these be the days of vengeance. Oh, yeah. God, the Father, they were these, they, he sent vengeance upon Jerusalem and the Jews for rejecting his son. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath, wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. And that's what happened, people, when, Jeru when the Roman legions came in. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time, times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now this right here ties into the book of Joel and the book of Revelation, which, God willing, I'm going to do uh, the book of Joel, a commentary on it. And because that's a book... Book of Joel is a big time, end times 
information, just like this chapter of the Bible and just like the book of Revelation. They all tie together. Signs in the skies. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. You see, there's people called preterists that say that all this was fulfilled in 70 AD. Did Christ come in the cloud with power and glory in 70 AD? No. No, he didn't. So part of this was partially fulfilled, and then evidently there's going to be a complete fulfillment sometime in the future. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Do you know what redemption means? It means to be redeemed. It means, um, let's say, for example, you go to a pawn shop with something that's a value and you need money really bad. You sell something you have. Uh, let's say a gold watch. You give it to them for a loan. Well, you've got a certain amount of time to go back with that money plus interest to redeem your item. Well, that's what it is. You're getting something back that was sold. Well, we were sold into slavery of sin. And who's our Redeemer? Christ. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree, Judah. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, Ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day, so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always, pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You know, these are the words of Christ. Christ said to pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Do you pray that you're going to be counted worthy to escape these things? What are the Baptist churches? They don't. They, I've never heard this preached in a Baptist church. Never. And I, I rail on the Baptist church because that was the Bible college that I attended. And that's mostly the churches that I attended were uh, Baptist churches. So I know their theology better than any other church's theology. I mean, they got some good points, but they got some bad points, too. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 6. Now, this ties in with Matthew, I mean, uh, not, I'm sorry, the book of Luke that we just read about the end time stuff, uh, about the tribulation. And there's people that call themselves preters, so they'll tell you that everything in Matthew 24 and that Luke, chapter in Luke that we just read, uh, that that was all fulfilled in in in. 70 AD, when the Roman army, Roman armies, their legions, surrounded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. 
but I've noticed they always ignore the book of Revelation. They have to. I mean, there's just so many things in Revelation that haven't happened yet. All right. Revelation 6, 1. And, when I, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, the color of communism. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, never mind. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another, uh, one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil, and the wine. Now, a penny back in these days was basically a day's wage for an unskilled laborer. And a measure, a measure is basically, they're basically saying a loaf of bread for a day's wages or three loaves of barley uh, for a penny. For, for basically, it's going to take you all day long, an unskilled labor, all day long to work for a loaf of bread. Does that mean the wages are so depressed that the wages are down? Or does it mean that the cost of the food has risen so high? Can you imagine working all day for a loaf of bread? Nothing on it, just a loaf of bread. Famine, people. Verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Doesn't that tie in with uh, what we just read with Luke about how the Lord's going to give you a mouth speaking great things and they're going to take you to the synagogues and, and rulers and kings for his name's sake. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou... Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. You know, if the pre-trib rapture was true, and this took all, you know, the pre-trib rapture happened before, then why are they waiting? I mean, you know, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, the Lord lets everything happen until the end, and that's when the harvest is. Verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Remember that uh, in Luke, he said that there'd be Earthquakes in diverse places, signs in the heavens, and the stars in the sky, right? And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, 
and the moon became as blood. And the stars of hell, heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. There's no fruit on that tree, people. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the mighty men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Good question. Who's going to be able to stand in the day of the wrath of the Lamb? That's why we're told to pray that we be counted worthy to stand before the Lamb, the Son of Man. Because we want to be able to stand before him and what words do we want to hear? Well, the answer to that is found in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Very important, people. And you want to have a white robe that's given to you, a wedding garment for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, you know, think about it. If the pre-trib rapture is true, like they teach, and, you know, all the believers go up, to the Lord and they're in the marriage you know they're at the marriage supper of the lamb during the pre you know when the tribulation is going on what about the people that die for their faith during the tribulation do they miss the uh the marriage supper of the lamb uh you know that's a good question but don't ask that in a baptist church because you'll be told to leave if you ask that during a bible study anyway so that's been my experience so all right, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus, who is Christ. And uh, this is the conclusion of the fig tree. And I was going to do the book of Joel, but I ran into the fig tree, and I knew I'd have to explain the fig tree for the book of Joel to make sense. So, well, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain